Welcome to another broadcast of Philosophic Perspectives with Arthur D. Schwartz on the Artist First Radio Network. All past shows are archived and can be picked up at artistfirst.com. And now here's your host, Arthur D. Schwartz. Hello, everybody. Once again, nice to be with you. Um, well, I've had an interesting week, I'll tell you. Uh, this uh, show for me, I've, I really enjoy it so much because for me, it's kind of an expression of uh, my existential state. Uh, because every week is different, every day is different, things happen, and as uh, someone who is a, has a philosophical orientation, it gives me an opportunity to reflect. And just, it just so happens that I have a radio show where I can <coughs> share my, my reflections. So I, I'm really enjoying it, and um, it's um, something that uh, uh, I'm going to be doing. You know, I, I enjoy doing the monologues, but I'm, I'm going to, the show will be moving in different uh, directions. And uh, so uh, we'll see how it goes. But today will be another reflection on my, of my last week. Um, I need to have you just hold on one second, please. Okay, I am back. Just had to, had to shut a door. Well, so this is what happened. Uh, I had um, I woke up last uh, Thursday morning, uh, the twenty eighth, and I had on the Social Philosophizers Club. I had a uh, a meeting uh, scheduled. Uh, the meeting is called uh, was called um, atheism, theism, deism, and the rest of us. I actually had this. Um, at that topic on a couple of other groups over the past few year, past few years, and uh, so I wrote a um, little introduction as I normally do. And I woke up on Thursday, I went onto the site, and I someone did not like what I said. Boy, she was just criticizing me and calling me. Uh, well, it had turned into name calling uh, for her part. Uh, but that was done mostly through emails. But even even what was posted at the time, it was very very degrading and basically calling me an idiot. And so um, this is not about getting back. This is I'm not going to mention this person's name, and we're not going to really talk too much about um, what she actually said, except in very very briefly. And uh, but the way I I think we'll we, we'll start is because um, this was really uh, that that meeting. Um, Atheism, theism, deism, and the rest of us is really the the, the jump start. The name of this uh, show tonight is the elusive quest for truth and theology as ideology. And so, like most of the topics on the show, it's a derivative of the book I wrote, yes, Ethical Empowerment: Virtue Beyond the Paradigms. I will be reading um, uh, sections from the book tonight uh, in relevant areas. Um, but the way I'm going to start right now is to read you the short introduction of the show and uh... And not excuse me not of the show of the um... of the meeting that was held uh... last um, last friday okay so and this is and so um, hold on one second i'm in the wrong place as is my pension uh... here we go All right. One second, I gotta get to this place. Okay, right here. Okay, uh, I'll just read the whole thing. It's not very long. It's called Atheism, Theism, Deism, and the Rest of Us. Boston Area Philosophy Discussions, the earlier incarnation of the Social Philosophizers Club, discussed the topic of atheism, theism, and the rest of us twice before, both in both cases, December 10th, 2010, and January 27th, 2012. The meetings proved to be memorable and highly successful. It's been four years, and I think there's lots of reasons to revisit the topic again. I'm in the rest of this category. The big question concerning questions about God is not whether she, he, it exists, but what about, but about what the word means. If we do not agree on what God means, then how are we going to form an opinion about whether or not God exists? And if the question is not so much a question about existence than about 
meaning, then the distinction between atheism, theism, and deism become very muddled. Atheism, therefore, seems to, to me to be just as muddled as the various forms of belief in God. What is it that the atheist does not believe in? The atheist has just as much need for clarity on the meaning of God as do religionists, if only because you cannot disbelieve in something that you cannot define. Because if you cannot define your term, you cannot put it into a statement which you think you want to refute. Hence, the statement, God does not exist, is meaningless unless you are prepared to define the thing that you want to reject. Uh, that's really the main point, but I'll just go a little further to, because this person who was critical, uh, I think, um, looked at this as well. Buddhism provides an interesting focal point. I remember a number of years ago listening to a radio interview with Michio Kaku, the well-known physicist and writer of popular books on the subject. I don't recall the exact context, but a question, and by the way, I'm, I'm to insert, this was actually uh, listening to a Coast to Coast AM show that he was being interviewed on. I don't recall the exact context, but a question about God or spirituality came up. And he said that he was raised in a Buddhist home and that Buddhists are atheists. That comment struck me because I really do, do not think of Buddhism as being an atheist religion, which anyway is probably an oxymoron. I have since come to understand that Buddhism is considered non-theistic, Kaku's, uh, Kaku's comment aside, because while it rejects deities, it is, it is distinguishable from atheism. I'm not a student of the atheist movement, but my impression is that most people who today call themselves atheists refer to a very scientific, naturalistic, and radical empiricist view of reality that rejects any sense of immateriality and not merely theism while also embracing a humanism that deeply supports the notion that we don't need to believe in God to be moral and good. And in conclusion, my view is that God, the God issue is a big muddle, that while having speculative value has little, el does, has little else. For my part, I do not consider myself to be an atheist. However, I do not think one needs to believe in God to be good. My personal speculations flow more in a non-atheistic, Buddhistic direction, but I do not consider myself to be a Buddhist either, of believing that there is a transcendent mind of some sort that is complementary with notions of spirituality. This perspective can be very unscientific, but I believe in science, and I hope that I have at least provided some food for thought. So uh, th that's what it was. I thought that was fairly innocuous. I mean, obviously, if you're a very religious person and you just, you know, believe in your the doctrines of your faith and, 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 and don't accept doubt, well, you know, you might not like it. But, um, you know, from a lot of people, this is not particularly uh, offensive, I don't think. It's, I'm trying to be as open-minded as I can. All I'm saying basically here is that... Um, uh, Atheism and religion are in similar positions. Ne neither of them are uh, because we are all because we are human beings and imperfect, and our knowledge is finite. To uh, you know your beliefs, whether uh, that God does not exist or whether it uh, does exist, is um, something that's probably beyond, beyond the uh, reason. Now you you know we we can certainly everyone is. Uh, can believe whatever he or she believe, wants to believe. That, that's fine with me. I'm just talking philosophically, intellectually, you know, in terms of what the, is, is the bounds of reason. Uh, if you just believe it's your faith, because it's the way you grew up, brought up, fine. But philosophy is not really engaged in that area. Philosophy is involved with reason. What is reason capable of? And so... This person took a strong offense. So, so to, to actually put it in some context, I'm not going to go over, uh, you know, I'm not going to name her. Let's just call her Mary. Um, and I'm going to go over so a lot of the things she said to me uh, in email and some of the things that were posted, but were, which I took down, um, were just outright offensive. She did actually apologize at the end, uh, later in the day. Um, but he, he, these are two quotes that... Um, that part of what she put up there, which um, I find extremely peculiar. 
So she says, after reading, you know, in, in, ref in reference to the piece that I just read, she said, it's not philosophy. It's circular reasoning and confirmation bias. I'll repeat that. It's not philosophy. It's circular reasoning and confirmation bias. Uh, well, we'll go back, get back to that in a minute. Um, the second thing that I'm quoting here is a, a little bit longer, just a, by a little bit. Quote, your worldview is narrow, and what you call philosophy is no more than confirmation bias of postmodernism, of, of postmodern positivism. Real philosophy is the love of wisdom, and it discovers it does not seek to dominate the conversation or to filibuster at the sight of terms it dislikes. It starts in wonder. It submits to reality rather than trying to reign. Well, first of all, I, I, filibuster, I, I just wrote an article. On, you know, that's me talking. So in dominating, well, I'm just expressing my point of view. So I don't, I don't really get what she's talking about there. I'm just expressing my point of view. Now, she uses this circular reasoning and confirmation bias. Well, here's the thing. Uh, circular reasoning means you're always coming back to the same principle to justify, um, you know, to reinforce what was already said. So therefore, you, it, 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 you're, it uh, insulates itself from uh, rejection because you keep falling back to certain premises. You keep circulating back, circulating back to other premises. Uh, and the, the thing about it is, uh, I think it's that's her. I mean, I think that's what this person is is. Her, she has a particular religious faith of some sort that apparently transcends intellectualization. And if you don't share that, apparently you're engaging in circular reasoning. Whereas she starts in wonder and submits to reality rather than trying to reign. What is reality? Well, she's going to return to her own particular view of reality, which is a particular, I don't know what it is. I mean, I don't know this person. I've never met her. Uh, but it's a reality as far as, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of, I believe, uh, you know, I think she's, the, well, I'm not going to say anything, uh, it's in terms of uh, her belief system. And so I don't really see where circular reasoning is avoided. Now, I will say this. I think we all have to have a little circular reasoning. Um, it's it, because we have to start from somewhere. The, the trick is this. The trick is to uh, know how to escape uh, from that by, by having an open mind and having an ability to, um, uh, you know, admit that you maybe made a, made a mistake, maybe need to revise your belief. I write here, um, dogmatism is not inevitable, yet it is a paradox that at least some degree of dogmatic thinking is necessary for the advancement of knowledge. The trick, I believe, is that helps us, that, that helps us avoid real dogmatism and knee-jerk ideological thinking is an open mind that is willing to admit error and the need to change some of our beliefs from time to time, be it slight or the occasional thorough overhaul. And so, uh, actually, that's uh, one of the main themes um, that uh, I have uh, in my book. It's all, of my book is uh, Ethical Empowerment, Virtue Beyond the Paradigms. Now, the thing about it is, uh, when, I, when I, I, I argue about being able to go outside of paradigms, but that doesn't mean paradigms are worthless. We need paradigms. We need generalizations. We need premises in our arguments. We, could, we couldn't possibly think without them. The thing is, the problem is, the danger is that there is an inability to let go when it's justified, when some doubt is cast, whether it's in religion or science or anything else. And this is an extremely important uh, area of, you know, in our modern world, we see more than ever the dangers of dogmatism, 
of religious dogmatism. And I'm obviously thinking of ISIS, but, you know, for a lot of others as well. But, I mean, ISIS right now, I mean, you can see the insanity. As a matter of fact, dogmatism, uh, ideological rigidity, I would basically say is a form of collective insanity. Because what is, what is insanity other than delusion? And not allowing anything else to get in the way of your delusion. And so we have that in, polit- in political extremism, certainly, but we also do have it in religious extremism. I'm going to read from a chapter, uh, it's actually part one, section eight of my book, Ch- Changing Perspectives. <laughs> Excuse me. And so um, this will be, I'm going to read for a little bit, it'll be a few minutes. Philosophy is the search for rational perspective. The statement is suggestive of a particular philosophical perspective on philosophy, and its self-referential nature reflects one of philosophy's perennial preoccupation, the question, what is philosophy? Certainly, asking questions and challenging convention comprises much of the value in doing philosophy. The dualistic and oscillating nature of the basic ethical dualisms, that's the principle of my book, is intrinsically multi-perspectival, and the dualistic self-other perspective is only an initial perspective on ethics. There is no knowable absolute truth, and empowerment cannot be gotten in conflicting rules or nice maxims. In place of ethical legalism and dogma, it is necessary to establish a methodic perspectivism, that is also a plural perspectivism that, that not only tolerates and accepts a diversity of opinion and perspective, but also actively and aggressively seeks new and alternative views of actuality. Diverse perspective is a practical therapy for absolutism to help clear the cobwebs of preconception, sharpen the view, or even resuscitate perspectives that may be lost buried or forgotten. So, um, I don't want to take take too long reading this, but it, it is important. I want to get this across, so I'll, I'll read as much as I feel is pertinent. Uh, philosophical pers- uh, pluralism and philosophical perspectivism are f- fundamentally similar, but also quite distinct. Pluralism is an acceptance of a diversity of beliefs. And by the acceptance it inhales, by that acceptance it entails, excuse me, some measure of validity to a multiplicity of divergent viewpoints. Perspectivism, on the other hand, tends to place more emphasis on the uniqueness of each and every perspective. My perspective is my truth, even if my justification what I, of what I hold to be true is a matter of my own selective, self-limiting judgments. Generally, perspectivism, unlike pluralism, rejects any form of underlying or transcendental unity, even if it appreciates different perspectives that add to the multitude of perspectives that constitute the storehouse of knowledge. Therefore, Pluralism's emphasis is on diversity and a sort of unity that may or may not be thought of as transcendental, whereas the emphasis of perspectivism is on the uniqueness of perspective, even while it is quite capable of acknowledging and appreciating perspectival diversity. There is a synergistic and paradoxical relationship between pluralism and perspectivism. The more deeply Unique perspectives are understood the deeper and richer pluralism becomes. And the richer the culture of pluralism, the more value is placed on unique perspectives that fortify the pluralism. Fundamental to both pluralism and perspectivism is that there is no monopoly on truth. And there is no greater defense against dogma than a plural perspectivism which is my term, that aggressively seeks and welcomes new perspectives. I've spoken about this, I'm digressing now, I've spoken about this on the show many times, my concept of plural perspectivism. It's an eager solicitation of new ideas, not just merely an acceptance, but an eager eager solicitation. So in other words, it encompasses perspectivism and pluralism. And it's eagerly 
seeks other points of view to keep you honest, to keep us honest. It doesn't mean that we accept everything. That's in part, That would be insane. But to at least be open to their enter, to entertaining them is important. Now, of course, the core of my belief system is universal love, so that uh, for me, a pluralism is very, very broad, but it's not, it's not infinite. It, because it, if you're dealing with morality, you're dealing with the ethical you know, approach, which is you know, ethics, as you might say, the study of morality, uh, that you are bounded by love. That gives it, but that gives you a lot of platitude. It's not a narrow at, at all. It gives you a diversity of, of political norms and individual norms and so forth and so on. But it has to be bounded by love. Otherwise, I would say it's immoral. And if it's immoral, it's therefore intrinsically uh, irrational, in my view. Now, I'm going to skip down a little bit here. Nietzsche, who is generally considered to be the founder of philosophical perspectivism, also recognized the tension between a radical perspectivism that may appear more subjective and strident in denying truth, and in the case of Nietzsche, I, would, I wouldn't use the word transcendental, a more coherent perspectivism that embraces a wider collection of alternative perspectives. Here's an example of his radical perspectivism. Quote, There are many kinds of eyes. Even the Sphinx has eyes. And consequently, there are many kinds of truths. And consequently, there is no truth. But Nietzsche also acknowledges the necessary balance between a multiplicity of perspectives and selective, more egoistic belief. Because then he says, there is, or he says it elsewhere, rather, there is only a perspective seeing, only a perspective knowing. And the more affects we allow to speak about one thing, the more eyes, different eyes, we can use to observe one thing, the more complete will our concept of this thing, our objectivity, be. But to eliminate the will altogether, to suspend each and every affect, suppose that, supposing we were capable of this, what would that mean to be, but to castrate the intellect? So in other words, he said, if you accept everything, um, yeah, you, you couldn't think. You're castrating the intellect. Uh, I mean, I love Nietzsche. And so he, he, despite his reputation, you know, he, he, he attacked things from all sides. And so you see within his thinking you've got a radical perspectivism, but you also have a kind of, uh, of more of a, a pluralism that uh, appreciates um, a diversity of points of view. And, and he says, um, you know, the more complete our concept of the thing becomes. That, friends, is what it's all about being able to embrace or to understand a wide diversity of perspectives to just to challenge your own. And, uh, and so th that's why, again, I you know, uh, developed this, I, this concept called plural perspectivism, because we need to eagerly seek those things, not just wait, not to just bump into them, but eagerly seek them so that we can all, always keep ourselves honest, always keep ourselves in check, and if we did that, the world would be a better place. Now, um, I'm going to skip a little bit down but, uh, here because uh, the, the, one of the next, the next philosopher I deal with in this section is Isaiah Ber Berlin, a, a British philosopher, well, a emigrant, immigrant from, um, uh, I think, I'm not sure it was Russia, what, uh, or was it Poland? I'm not sure which, I think Russia. And um, he... Uh, was he, you know, in the, in the late 20th century, he was a very um, important philosopher of, of pluralism. He called, actually valued pluralism. He he thought there that there's really no objectivity in values. Uh, actually, as a matter of fact, I will um, read this to give you a sense. This is a pretty uh, color, uh, a pretty a pretty interesting uh, paragraph. And this is Isaiah Berlin. Values can clash. They can be incompatible between cultures or groups in the same culture or between you and me. You believe in always telling the truth, no matter what. I do not, because I believe that it can sometimes be too painful and too destructive. Justice, rigorous justice, is for some people an absolute value. But it is not compatible with what may be no less ultimate values for them, mercy, compassion, as it arises in concrete cases. 
Well, so I, in my book, I, got, I mean, I'm, I'm a strong critic of Bruin here because I do, I, I believe that he misses the point that the values themselves are in what matters. It's the underlying ethical tensions, the underlying morality of the situation that um, allows these values to um, to coalesce. Uh, because uh, you know what you what you call justice, what you call compassion, what you know, all depends upon is is it really in service of of love? They're just words. I mean, he recognizes that he said that he you know that when he when he rises in context in concrete cases. But the thing is, it's irrelevant, and the the values they're just words. It, they're just words. Uh, what matters is the situation. Is it a moral situation, or is it an amoral or immoral situation? The, 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 the word justice doesn't mean a thing. It, it, what, what's important is, is this country just, or is the society just? And then we have to evaluate that. The words that attach, that are frozen, you know, uh, you know fro- in frozen states, and un- inflexible uh, uh, concepts that just float in the air and they, they're not attached to anything. They're just words. They, they, you put it, they exist in a dictionary. That's not important. What's important is things called good, you know, right? I mean, again, what does good mean? What does right mean? Well, it's not absolute, but it's determined by the situation. And what determines that? It's how you interpret love. And so, uh, and, I, and again, I, I'm not going to go over there again, but um, I go into depth and that's on the subject in terms of what I call the basic ethical dualisms. Now, uh, here's the thing, though, that uh, this woman, Mary, that I'm calling her, uh, doesn't seem to understand. Because um, Isaiah Berlin, he, 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 he bumped into the same problem, and he didn't really address it too well, really. Because he realized that his idea of, of value pluralism, which was very liberal, you know, feeling that, you know, the mind is free to, to embrace a, a wide variety of ethical quests, and yet, but they're incompatible somehow, which I disagree with. Um, there's a problem with that. And the question is, what is the solution? So he, here's, what, here's um, the, the quotation concerns what he calls negative liberty. So he says, what then must be must the minimum be? That which a man cannot give up without offending because the essence, because, it, it, let me read that again. That which a man cannot give up without offending against the essence of his human nature. What is this essence? What are the standards which it entails? This has been and perhaps always will be a matter of infinite re, infinite debate. But whatever the principle in terms, whatever the principle in terms of which the area of non-interference is to be drawn, whether it is that of natural law or natural rights or of utility or the pronouncements of a categorical imperative or the sanctity of the social contract or any other concept with which men have sought to clarify and justify their convictions, Liberty, in this sense, means liberty from absence of interference beyond the shifting, but always recognizable frontier. Now, um, so th- there, there is a problem there because um, uh, let me just continue reading. Negative. This is my. This is me. A negative liberty, which uh, seems to echo Spencer's law of equal freedom and, li- and Mill's on, li- on liberty, uh, defends any action, provided that it does not interfere with the activity of others. However, Berlin's principle is even vaguer and more ambiguous than, than our Spencer's and Mill's. Berlin simply acknowledges that human destiny does not permit unfettered freedom of action and that there are basic princ- that there is a basic principle that takes precedent over pluralism. Value pluralism requires a foundation in order to prevent its application in the political sphere from denigrating into something that condones the very sort of absolutism that is intended to stop it is intended to stop or inhibit. If val- value pluralism in self-contradiction protects 
the violations of the personal freedoms it holds to be essential, then it has the potential of running full circle to justify absolute re regimes such as those of Hitler or Stalin. Berlin thus revealed a transcendental pluralistic side to his philosophy by attempting to create a floor beneath which his value pluralism and the incommensurability of values cannot sink into self-abnegation. But Berlin's balancing act is itself ultimately a genuine incommensurable, since it is a reductio, a reductio ad absurdum to argue that pluralism can exist only if it justifies the existence of that which it would lead to its self-destruction. It became necessary for Berlin to formulate the principle of negative liberty, but by so doing he acknowledges that incommensurables are secretly or implicitly commensurable. The resolution of the problem of, is a conceptualization of basic moral forces. The basic ethical dualisms, a conceptualization of the basic moral forces, are implicit in ethical discourse and permeate the breadth of morality and prevent incommensurability by encompassing a broad spectrum of moral incoherence. Anyway, the thing is, uh, he ran into a dead end. He ran into a dead end because the thing he was trying to uh, say was a guarantor of freedom, which is this principle of negative liberty, is going to allow the very thing that we all want to avoid, which is absolutism and vile social programs such as uh, Nazism or what we see today in ISIS or Daesh. So... This is this is the thing. So, uh, contrary to what that individual thought, uh, I am a firm believer in something very close to spirituality. I think it is spirituality, which is universal love. It's just that when someone begins to say that he or she has the re can can dismiss you because you are being circular, because you are being whatever, without even knowing anything about it, uh, is actually the very picture of circular reasoning. Circular reasoning is basically dogma, because it is reasoning that is, is, makes itself immune from contradiction. That I know best, and I don't have to listen to what you say. That I have a right to, 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 to insult you, I have a right to call you an idiot, I have a right to, to use um, so-called uh, someone who's studying uh, you know, spiritual uh, writings, uh, dealing with vile language. Uh, so, and that, that's what you have in dogma. And just like you have uh, organizations like ISIS or Daesh killing people in the name of God because of their dogma, because of their ideology... That's why this is an important subject, to keep the mind open, to, to, to look deep in your heart and find what you truly feel is justifiable, not by some dogmatic conception of God that you pretend you know and no one else. Give me a break. You're a dogmatist. You're an ideologue. You've got a small brain. And those people, those, those ice, you know, you're Nazi, you're ISIS, you're Huda, you're Stalinist, whatever, and you're trying to you say that you know better than anybody else, they are the worst and vile form of human being. Do I want to kill them? No, I don't. What I want to do is just breathe a fresh of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of, uh, some fresh air into the brains, of, into the consciousness of the human race to respect each other. And 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 all weigh what weigh your principles among among the light in the light of love. If you don't want to do that, then you know what? You are less than human. Should we kill you? No. But we should we should actually eliminate you from our society, or maybe take them to another planet, dump them on the moon, put them in the ocean. I don't give a damn. If you, if you reject love, you reject your association with your humanity. And so you should be treated like a dog, which I wouldn't kill. Okay, I think it's time for a break. And uh, I, when we come back, we'll deal with the second aspect of my interesting week.
In Ethical Empowerment, Virtue Beyond the Paradigms, Arthur D. Schwartz presents an ethical theory that is a framework for evaluating moral conundrums that go beyond legalistic rulemaking, dogmatism, and preconditioned thinking. The book is as much an ethical framework for unconventional ideas as it is for staying with convention. Ethical empowerment is a manifesto of non-doctrinaire perspective. Ultimately, the hypnotic thinking of ideology and dogmatism can only be overcome by returning to the true source and essence of morality, which is nothing less than universal love. Discover how the philosophically liberating approach of the ethical empowerment can be applied to the range of ethical, social, and political controversy. Read about a plan to eliminate all political parties. Entertain the possibility of an overhaul of the patent system and its replacement with a system that rewards inventors while eliminating monopolistic control of patents and technological suppression. Many other transformative ideas are discussed in the book, including issues related to the monetary system, real estate, scientific paradigms, and a rational approach to conspiracy theory. While ethical empowerment will challenge your mind to consider new perspectives, the ethical challenge is always to keep the diversity, depth, and breadth of perspective within the boundaries of love. Ethical Empowerment is available at Amazon.com and most online booksellers in both print and e-book editions. Hi, this is John Mayer, and you're listening to Artist First Radio. This is Arthur D. Schwartz. You know, beliefs and disbeliefs can be very powerful. Much like philosophy, hypnotism is concerned with belief. Hypnotherapy, a practical application of hypnotism, may largely be described as the practice of removing false beliefs that form mental blocks to success, to happiness, and to well-being. In my hypnotherapy and philosophical counseling practice, I combine my work in philosophy with hypnotism in order to clear mental blockages that can occur on both conscious and subconscious levels. A mental block may be conscious or subconscious and can be expressed, for example, in the form of anxiety, low self-esteem or low motivation, bad habits, tobacco habits, weight gain, low performance, and much more. If you are interested in using hypnosis and the power of the mind to overcome mental blocks and barriers that have emerged in your life, please feel free to give me a call at 617-964-4800 or visit www.integralhypnosis.com. That's I N T E G R A L hypnosis dot com. You put your keys between your knuckles. Someone approaches you and you cross to the other side of the street. You lock the door behind you, maybe twice. Now you feel safe. You think you've made the right choices to protect yourself. Think again. Because if you're not eating right, if you're not active, or if you smoke, you're putting yourself at risk for disease. Learn to protect yourself from yourself at everydaychoices.org. A message from the American Cancer Society, American Diabetes Association, American Heart Association, and the Ad Council. Are you a person who enjoys intellectual social interaction and finds digging deeper into the nature of things, from big issues to everyday life, an important part of the pleasure of life? Social Philosophizers is a Boston-area social club for those who desire intellectual socializing. It's a club for both singles and non-singles and for anyone who finds intellectually mingling to be the best form of social mingling. The club offers a variety of interesting venues such as philosophical get-togethers in private venues, book discussions concerning literature and philosophy, topical discussions over brunch or dinner, guest speakers, theater, after-work mixers, even long philosophical ruminations along nature trails or city streets and more. 
If you live in the greater Boston area or occasionally spend time in the area, you can choose a cost-effective membership level that's right for you. Basic membership is free. Find the link on Arthur's Philosophical Perspectives show page at artistsverse.com or just search socialphilosophizers.com. We hope you'll join Social Philosophizers today. That's socialphilosophizers.com. Thanks for tuning in this installment of Philosophic Perspectives on the Artist First Radio Network. Let's get back to your host, Arthur D. Schwartz. Well, hello again. I know I get a little bit, uh, I have a, I get a little excitable, um, but uh, I do it from love. Um, now, okay, uh, so let's segue to the, the second part of the show, which was another really interesting thing that happened. So, I decided while well, I was going to talk about what I just talked about, you know, my favorite theme of uh, open-mindedness and uh, multiple perspectives, plural perspectivism, I call it, and um, and I, I talked in terms of what this what happened in terms of my social philosophizer club, and someone was um, just uh, teed off, you know, just uh, felt justified in doing all kinds of saying all kinds of things, which I, I wouldn't have recognized it. Because I, I, first of all, I don't think she really under, she knows anything about my thought anyway. Uh, she just she's based upon this little article I wrote, which I th- thought was equal, uh, was even-handed. Uh, I don't really think that, despite, despite the very high opinion she has of herself, she doesn't seem to be able to comprehend things very well. But um, seriously, um, but in, in any case, uh, what just happened recently goes back to I, I heard from uh, our friend Martin Roy Hill who um, was the guest of my show on uh, October 25th called uh, The Ancient Alien Argument with author Martin Roy Hill. That's the show you can listen to on podcast on uh, October 21st, 2015, and the podcasts are list- listed um, on the homepage. Uh, on, not the home, but on my show page, on the bottom of the page, at artistfirstradio.com. Um, and... Uh, and he, he informed me about a new story that came out that some of you may be aware of, uh, but I wasn't. I've had a crazy week, so I'm not paying attention. I don't know how big of a new story this was, so maybe everyone's heard of it or, or not. But um, highly credible astronomers, to a, t- a team of two highly credible, uh, highly regarded astronomers, have announced that they now believe that there is good evidence that there is indeed a ninth planet. You know, Pluto is no longer considered a planet, so it used to be the ninth but there's now a new ninth planet, which is about the size of Neptune. And it's an, in an elliptical path that completes its orbit every 15,000 years. Now, here's the thing. Those of you interested in um, alternative uh, theories of um, human evolution and UFOs and the extraterrestrial issue and so forth and so on, uh, I'm sure are familiar with Zachariah Sitchin. And his theory was that um, in the uh, extraterrestrials from the planet Nibiru uh, landed um, and about 3,600 years ago. And their planet Nibiru is, uh, was on this elliptical org- orbit that would circle um, the sun every 3,600 years. Now, the astronomers would would just reject that as even being possible to have that kind of an orbit. 3,600 years. But we now have two highly credible astronomers, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, refer you to their site, or to, to the information anyway. It takes this planet that they believe exists about the size of Neptune, Every 15,000 years. And these are, once again, I want to keep repeating myself, highly, highly regarded astronomers. 
and I, I think they're having support in the, in the astronomical community. It seems because the evidence they've shown is extremely compelling. It's going to be have, it's going to have to undergo more testing. Of course, it's going to take some time, but the evidence right now indicates such. So this isn't necessarily evidence for the validation of Zachariah Sitchin and his theories about es- extraterrestrials, the Anunnaki landing, and which uh, you know basically created the human race by through hybridization of um, the existing hominids on the planet Earth with their own um, you know DNA, and you know that certainly doesn't uh, address that, but. Uh, as uh, as uh, Martin pointed out to me in his in his email, it is an awful lot of similarity with this with this very controversial uh, area of this uh, this huge elliptical orbit, you know, known as planet Planet X. I'm sure most you know have heard you've heard of uh, that term. And so here here's the thing. Here we go again. Uh, the the danger in just dogmatically rejecting a theory when you really don't have grounds to reject it. The thing is about Zachariah Sitchin, uh, he, he, his uh, books um, were uh, quite, um, I mean, you may not have agreed with it, but he has a lot of uh, information in terms of the ancient Sumerian texts. And a lot of thought went into it, it wasn't it j- just on the face of it. It didn't seem ridiculous. Yet th- it's ridiculous to someone who has a closed mind and says the idea of the human race being started by, by uh, you know, the intervention of an al- alien an alien species is just intrinsically stupid. It's impossible. It's not worth m- not worth talking about. Not worth considering. And um, you know, this is his collection of books was uh, the Twelfth Planet and its sequel, and and, and and many, and he had, you know, many sequels, and he kind of in a semi-novel form, but it, uh, it was a novel form really. But he he, he sets forth, um, you know, his thinking in, in 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 all these books. The most famous is the Twelfth Planet, and uh, the one of the most you know critical aspects of his theory was this huge elliptical orbit. That took 3,600 years to to achieve. Now, uh, that doesn't mean that you know, that the rest of his theory is correct. But that's even enough, isn't it? I mean, isn't that incredible? Uh, 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 discovering a planet the size of Neptune, which we can't see because of it's being obscured by the by the by the nature of its orbit, and um, it takes 15,000 years. That's roughly what four times, um, uh, roughly four times the, uh, the the length of time that um, that Sitchin was talking about. Uh, you know, because frankly, let's say Sitchin was right, and the Sumerians are, however, they're writing this is, is this information. You know, what was imparted to them. Um, it's easy, you can easily come up with explanations of why he came up with 3,600 rather than 15,000. I mean, maybe the aliens, if, if, such, if they existed, maybe they, you know, want, didn't want to actually give them uh, the, the, the actual length of time, or maybe it was misunderstood, or maybe it was mistranslated, or, or you know, whatever. Um, it doesn't seem at this particular phase of, the, of, the, of this inquiry to be that important. Just that the fact that a uh, elliptical orbit now is being um, uh, not confirmed, but now showing that being said that it has real evidence, and it's actually about the the the, the, the length of the orbit is orbit is, is like four times as long as Sitchin said. So here's this is the um, you, if you uh, go on to uh, sciencemag.org. Um, you have an article by Eric Hand, Planet Lurks Beyond Pluto. And I'll just read a little bit here. The solar system appears to have a new ninth planet. Today, two scientists announced evidence. Well, this is uh, January 20th. It just occurred. January 20th. Today, two scientists announced evidence that a body near, uh, nearly the size of Neptune 
but as yet unseen, orbits the sun every 15,000 years. During the solar system's infancy, 4.5 billion years ago, they say, the giant planet was knocked out of, a, of the plant-forming region near the sun, slowed down by gas. The planet settled into a distant elliptical orbit where it still works today. And this, uh, this goes on to say, the claim is the, stro- the strongest yet in the centuries-long search for a planet X beyond Neptune. The quest has been plagued by far-fetched claims and even outright quackery. But the new evidence comes from a pair of respected planetary scientists, Konstantin Batijin and Mike Brown of the California Institute of Technology. Caltech, okay. Caltech, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, who prepared for the inevitable skepticism with detailed analyses of the orbits of other distant objects and months of computer simulations. If you say we have evidence for planet X, almost any astronomer astronomer will say, this again? These guys are clearly crazy. I would too, Brown says. Why is this different? This is different because this time we're right. Outside Outside scientists say their calculations stack up and express a mixture of caution and excitement about the result. And so um, he says, he quotes, I I could not imagine a bigger deal if, and of course that's a bold face, if it turns out to be right, says Gregory Laughlin, a planetary scientist at the University of California, Santa Cruz. What's thrilling about it, the planet is detected, uh, it is detectable. What's thrilling about it, he says, is it is detectable. So anyway, it's a long article. I'm certainly not going to read that, but you get the idea. So, uh, so when I, you know, when I, I, um, I heard from Martin and um, kind of, uh, you know, I need to get back to him, and um, I was very busy, and I didn't really, um, I read it quickly, and I was impressed, but I didn't follow through with it. And then that incident with that particular person I talked about in the first half of the show happened, and. Uh, I wanted to come up with something to talk about today, and I thought about um, reacting to what, what that um, to what that woman um, uh, said, wrote, 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 and so forth um, last uh, almost a week ago. And uh, then when I looked, when I returned to Nor- to Martin's email uh, and got back to him, you know, uh, it took me much too long. I put the two together because here we go. Is this is a case of showing the, how redundant or sick, uh, um, circular or dogmatic or ideological or paradigmatic, paradigmatic or whatever term you want to use, in other words, rigid, inflexible thinking, how consistently it, we, we find exceptions. Uh, as we go, we just continue to find exceptions. Now, so what am I saying? I'm not. I'm not saying that you shouldn't have your point of view and stick to it. There's nothing wrong with that. What I find offensive is that when you have an alternative view, you are berated. Scientists, and speaking of science in particular, they are berated. They can be, lose all credibility. They can lose their jobs. They can lose their funding. They can lose their professorships, okay, because they just decide to come up with something. No, I don't know how these two did it. Um, maybe things are changing. Hope they are. Maybe things are changing. Maybe we're entering into a world where everything is a time where everything is possible. Um, we've talked about the singularity. That's another group that I'm involved with on the, at the Social Philosophizers Club. And uh, the singularity basically is another version of everything is possible. Because if there is to be a singularity, it basically means machine intelligence takes over, and therefore the dynamic, the, the extrapolation of conclusions is now unpredictable because the machines are taking care of it rather than... Um, human brains. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know how thoroughly I, I agree with that or, or not, um, but there's certainly something to it. And uh, it, it all goes to the fact that I think um, 
what's happening as time moves on, the idea that narrow-minded, knee-jerk, dogmatic people, even people who use dogmatism to claim that they're not dogmatic, uh, which is kind of a funny thing, but which I've just witnessed this week, as I talked about before. Um, it's uh, Maybe it's becoming increasingly unacceptable because as one pin drops one after the other, as one impossibility suddenly becomes possible, then finally it may be that that we will really enter in a, a, a new ep, uh, uh, epoch because an epoch of uh, an, a, 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 um, an age of a new age of reason that is less myopic, that is broader, that embraces, embrace, uh, embraces diversity, that it, it accepts the possibility um, of, I'm going to turn this off. I got my, you know, I, I it was speaking about technology, I mean, I'm, I'm a newcomer to the iPhone, and um, I, I mean, I did, I had, I had a, I had a, uh, a, a flip phone. <laughs> I, I, about three months ago, I was still using a flip phone, so now I got all this going on, so people are texting me and stuff. Um, and uh, we're going to reach, a, I think, a point with all the things that are happening that finally, the notion of unpredictability, the notion notion of turning the world upside down in terms of the ideas that we that we have and the technology, and the notion of what humanity is capable of, that it, it doesn't have to be in a one certain way. It has to do more with loving intention and loving. Um, Affect the effectuality, the intentionality, and the effectuality. What that embraces and what it actually impacts the world as, which are not necessarily the same thing. And so, uh, I am a, I am meandering again. Um, I realize that. Um, I, guess, I guess the show is coming uh, shortly to an end, but not so quick because I have the opportunity to go a little longer. And so. I know I've been rambling uh, there, uh, but I do think I've made my points. I do feel what I'm saying is um, is is powerful because um, this news about this planet X. If you really, if you would read through all the articles in the past that have been lambasted and made and made fun of and called quackery about the possibility of this hugely elliptical orbit we don't know about planet X, and suddenly two Caltech scientists say, yeah. It exists. Unbelievable. Well, let's go full circle. Speaking about circular thinking, this is just a very, very, my, the, a chapter, part two, section 50 of my book, the last chapter or the last section of my book. It's just a very short, it's about a couple of pages. And um, it's called The Meaning of Faith. So I think, based upon how I started tonight's uh, program, uh, I'm going to end it on this, in, in, a, with a, in, in a certain way in a similar theme. The meaning of faith. Faith is a leap, a leap into, well, let me start again. Faith is a leap to a level beyond ordinary trust. Faith in oneself comes with the power of positive thinking and is the heart of athletic feats in the height of competition. I, I'm going to start again because you know I was I'm having a hard time holding this book, so and, uh, I'm trying to have I'm holding too many things at one time. I'm going, to, I'm going to start over again if I might. Faith is a leap to a level beyond ordinary trust. Faith in oneself comes with the power of positive thinking and is the heart of freedom and overcoming. It can produce incredible acts of courage, amazing athletic feats, and the height of competition the will to create and invent, decisiveness and motivation. And for many, faith in oneself is a basis of spirituality and can glorify the potential for individual greatness that resides in the heart of every human being. 
It can also be the subjective link to a sense of the mystical. The Buddhists call this the true self. And for many others, it is simply the ineffable sense of faith or sense or faith in what is traditionally referred to as one's soul. Faith in others extends to groups or organizational associations. You can join a young startup company because you believe in its mission and you are impressed with the principal owners and the management team. You have the opportunity to earn more money by working for other firms, but you have faith that this young company is the path to your success. Unfortunately, the success hoped for does not materialize. Perhaps you have lost your faith in the fledgling business and also perhaps in those who managed it. But it is also possible that even though the enterprise was not successful, your faith in those involved in the business will remain unshaken and you would work with the same group again if future opportunities should arise. Part of faith is in the integrity and intelligence of a person or an organization that learns from error and overcomes failure. There have been connections between faith in God and faith in nations. The link has often been unfortunate because faith in country and faith in God have at times been disastrously conflated in order to justify the most ungodly acts of senseless war, death, suffering, and destruction. Confusing faith in nation and faith in God has the most heinous potential. Lincoln knew this well. He humbly prayed that his leadership be on God's side. He did not have the temerity or audacity to pray that God be on his. Who are we to divine the mind of God and thereby justify wanton acts of death and destruction? However, faith in a great nation can be warranted when it is founded on the belief that the government, leadership, and citizenry are dedicated to an unbounded love that guides conduct along a path of dignity, moral intentionality, and virtue. Faith in a nation must, most of all, be a humble faith that acknowledges the potential for error and the consequences of the misguided use of power. If faith in a nation is morally invested, it will be in the potential for true greatness that becomes possible when the national will is dedicated to the expression of loving intention in all dealings with its citizenry and with other nations. Faith, by its very nature, must always be steeped with humility, because every faith is a leap beyond the knowable. With great humility, it acknowledges that sometimes good intentions fail, or our actions may not always be on God's side, but with resilient and courage, we can make things right. We can see how faith is a belief in an active principle whose unpredictability is its strength for rising to the occasion and mastering situations in which set rules and prescribed solutions may not apply. However, faith can extend beyond individuals to dogma and ideology. Ideology seeks to supplant true wisdom by substituting broad precepts, precepts and theories as the basis of faith. Many millions have died for their faith in particular ideologies. Faith in radical capitalism fills the American airwaves ad nauseum at, as its proponents preach the gospel that they're currently, that, that they're currently invoke conservatism will solve all economic and social problems. Marxist-Leninist ideologues still promote their vision of a reign of terror that they would call justice. Religious extremists are seen promulgating an, exceed an exceedingly cruel subjuga subjection of women as a virtue or displaying more concern with scriptural prophecy than lasting peace. In an ideological faith, we see the glorification of mindless stupidity of some who dance around in praise of their sinful dogma and sacrilegiously praise God, praise the Lord, praise Allah. And this is their faith. It is as if God were an insecure despot in need of constant praise lest he unleash his jealous venom. 
it is time to leave ideology in the dustbin of history so that we may finally begin the long march of true freedom from the shackles of dogma. What does faith in God mean? This can be a very open question. To some, God can even can even be the very idol that the God of the Bible condemns. But if you are to have faith in God, then idol worship is likely to be a faith easily lost. Your idols will be swiftly shown to be the blocks of stone, wood, or rigid, breakable ideologies that they are. But the various faiths of God, in, in the God of the great religions, also need to be sustainable by more than ideological doctrine that is continually crammed into the brains of believers from childhood until death. While there is no escaping that we all have belief systems, they do not require dogmatic conformity or coercion in order to us appreciate in order for us to appreciate their values. Does faith in the power and ultimate victory of good over evil sound like dogma? Tenets concerning good and evil can, in religious ideology, be attached to specific conceptions or beliefs in God. But this is not my faith in the power of good over evil or any notion of God. My interpretation of the concept of God is informal. But since no one has ever defined God in a manner satisfactory to all believers, it may be used in its generality which I take to be a transcendental principle, essence, mind, spirit, consciousness, creator, that is in some manner an underlying force in the universe and of life. But faith built upon ideology is ideology and nothing more. And faith in an ideology is not faith in God. Faith in a religion is not faith in God, but only faith in an ideology. Faith transcends any doctrine, and it consists of feelings as much as of belief. Faith in God cannot pretend to be scientific or it will be something that it is not. Faith in God is attached to the good and to the morality and right conduct, but they alone do not comprise faith or explain it. Faith in God is most of all a deep form of conscious belief that merges with subconscious feeling and conviction often with great intuitive force concerning the oneness of which morality and good are primary expressions. Faith in God, when stripped of all ideology and doctrine, is the ever-evolving consciousness of what is good versus uh, that which is not good or, in the worst case, evil, and that by virtuous striving we may believe or feel that our faith inches closer to God's consciousness and its expression of love in the world. Faith in moral and ethical progress is faith in the ability of human beings and all rational beings to be in harmony with the universe. This faith may be consistent with Taoism, Stoicism, mysticism, and other mystical or spiritual systems. Living in harmony with the universe without ideology is always an open question. Harmony can ultimately be defined by its moral coherence, and yet the degree of its actualization will always be disputable. An entrepreneur's life can be more harmonic and morally coherent than that of a monk. And any prejudice towards one over the other is dogma, pure and simple. Religious beliefs in heaven or nirvana cannot be validated or confirmed in this life, and the slippery loopholes of theology insulated from refutation. But faith in ideology, excuse me, but faith in theology is an ideology. It is not faith. I'm going to repeat that. Faith in theology is an ideology. It is not faith in God. Faith in any particular religion or set of religious doctrines is not faith in God, but only a particular faith in an ideology that purports to know something about God. Maybe there is a spiritual validation of our lives, or maybe there is none to be had, but faith must transcend its unknowing. 
in our unknowing, we can still have faith because faith in, is in, in no, excuse me. In our unknowing, we can still have faith because faith in non-dogmatic and non-ideological principles applied with humility, dedicated to loving intention, and practiced with mindful openness to error and correction is the uh, indomitable path to knowing that we have done our best. Faith in God, in good faith, presuppose doctrines that pretend divine knowledge. Let me repeat that. Faith in God cannot, in good faith, presuppose doctrines that pretend divine knowledge. Such a, print, such a pretense would be unphilosophic and meaningless. But as with wisdom, faith has no final destination. So with that concluding chapter... I'm just, it's, it's a good conclusion for tonight's show because all I'm trying to say here, ladies and gentlemen, is do our best. Be open. Don't be thick-headed. Open your, open your mind to that which is lovingly considered. Use love as the guide. And then all good things become possible. There's no one way. There's no, you, you, you know, when you're born, you, there's no one profession you could go into. There's a multitude of things you can um, experience, a multitude of, a tu- of people uh, you can acquaint yourself. You, you, know, you, end, you know, we end up in certain situations, and, and that's just the nature of things. Um, but there's not necessarily only one way. And when we recognize that, that the, the nature of a loving a consciousness and a loving life uh, allows for differences. But those differences must be embraced by love, or they are what they are. They are bad. Now, bad things have to be dealt with, but in the end, too, they must be dealt with in the most loving way. That is practical. So, I think I just uh, concluded, once again, another show. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I want to thank, once again, Scott for his assistance. He's been great. And uh, so this concludes tonight's broadcast. For links to my book, Ethical Empowerment, my philosophical counseling and hypnotherapy practice, and the Social Philosophizers Club, please visit arthurdschwartz.com. And this is Arthur D. Schwartz reminding you to live well and think deeply. Until next time, good night, everybody.